Dumbledore had to drink that potion and all the, the skeletons were in the water and they came up there to go to this cove and the sea was raging and they made their way in, in this boat and then they drank the poison and then the Horcrux had already been taken. In many ways the church can seem like that. We live in a sea of relativism. It's fluid, it's loose, <coughs> do what you want. I believe this, you believe that. We move, And then you hit against the church and its beliefs. And it's like the waves washing up against this huge rock. Because the church suddenly tells me, um, you can't get married. Hey, well, I want to get married, we love each other. And think, You're already married. Oh, that was then, this is now. <laughs> Um, sorry, yeah, look, you can't go to communion. What do you mean I can't go to communion? It's my right and things like that. Yeah, but take that sash off and then you can come to communion. You're making a political statement. Sorry, you can't do that. How dare you? I want to say my politics and everything. And like that in, in many different areas. Even, you know, it comes down to perhaps some pretty basic ones too. What are you telling me that I can't? I see it this way and how, what are you, who gives you the right to do this? God. Who says that you're a representative of God? What arrogance? Well, all of this comes up. Now, this tidal wave of relativism, which is powerful, erodes the rock face. And people start to sort of give in a little bit, and the church backs off. And, but somehow, even though it erodes, then there's these tectonic shifts in the church, these plate shifts, and up comes new rock, new movements. And again, you're faced with this absolutism in every generation of the church. And so the sea gets, you know, washes up again and crashes against it. What if, says Harry to the snake, what if we were to look at these commandments of the church? Let's forget God for a little, just, just, just for argument's sake. Do the Ten Commandments make sense? Well, let's look at the rationale behind what the church is saying. Maybe, maybe there's a, a little point to it. Let's see, what about murder? What if we turned the Ten Commandments around and we said, you know, thou shalt murder? What do you reckon about that? How would that be for society? Thou shalt commit adultery. How would that be for, you know, family relationships? Thou shalt treat one's parents badly. Thou shalt steal. Uh, doesn't sound good. We have limitations. We are creatures. Sure, we are called responsibly to make choices, but those choices can be bad ones. What about the Horcrux? Voldemort is doing what he thinks to be best, power. He divides himself up. I want to, you know, to be self-sufficient. I don't want anyone to be able to attack me. I don't want to be vulnerable. I split myself up in all these different ways. He's cutting out his own soul. In the end, what has he really achieved? And he's had to murder each time he's done that too, to make it work. Has that been a good choice? Well, it was his choice. It's true, and no one's taking that away from him. But what about the consequences of those choices? Should you not at least point that out and say, Voldemort, not a good idea? Is that really such a bad thing? Autonomy, autonomy, and this is one of these big, big points. Autonomy, in many ways for our society, is in fact a social construct. People love to say, well, you know, talk about marriage, social construct. Uh, protection of life or abortion, social construct. Anything you want, it's always a social construct. What about autonomy? Is that a social construct? And the irony is, in many ways it is. Because other societies do see autonomy and choice in a different way to how we see it. We give you know, an absolute value to autonomy, to choice. My choice. Choice is important. The Catholic Church teaches that choice is important. It does. But it's not an absolute, it's limited. Ah, and this is where the rub comes in. I was on the plane the other day, taking back from Harry and Hermione, just for a moment, but uh, on my way back to New Zealand, being picked up the Kiwi accent. And um, I was talking to a, a woman, 60 years of age, and she was um, telling me that she used to be a Catholic, but she's left it, thank you very much. And she went through different reasons why she had left. Starting from the school uniform being daggy. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a reason, you know. Through people have their reasons. Um, but but the, the, the main one, though, the main one, though, when I we spoke about, you know, because the priest liked to tipple a bit and all these things, you know, human failings. I said, well, look, we're creatures, we're limited. And she said, 
rubbish. Rubbish. We're divine. How, you know, it's your faith, this Catholic Church, tells me that I'm not God. How could that be? Now, that was a difficult, that was a tricky one for me to try to find some common ground, because it is a little bit essential that we are limited creatures. Autonomy is very important, but we also need to highlight that we are not self-sufficient. We do depend upon others, we do live in society, we do have constraints. And the church points those out to us as well. Even, even if it is a question of living with the Dursleys under the stairwell, at least it is you know, food and shelter. Harry on his own, no matter how much his mother had loved him, could not have lived without at least other people being there, no matter how unloving they may have been. And then the Ginny says, okay, fine, maybe, maybe my master has made a few bad choices, but at least they were his own. He made his own choices. He took his own responsibility. He takes his own risks. Why not do the same? Okay, the church says whatever it says, but live a little. Look, you're going to get married to Ginny. Why do you have a little bit of a, you know, a bit of fun with Cho beforehand? <laughs> now, what's stopping you? Why not? The snake again. Interesting. Well, you say, well, what's the nature of love? I mean, if I really do want to give myself to Ginny, I want to commit myself to Ginny. There's an exclusivity in that love. I am my body, and the history of my body goes with me. I can't treat something important like a one flesh union between two people as though it were not important. Even if I were to treat it as not important, it would still be important. It would still have its consequences in my life. And for my relationship with the one who I do really want to exclusively give myself to. Now, you can argue about that, but when you examine it in your own case, in the first person, and you think, how will that affect my relationship with Ginny, knowing I've been so intimate with Cho? Well, that's something to think about. Identity. Identity. And here's the big one. Here's the biggie. Here is the biggie. Harry's been talking to the priest, and he's read a few things. He's read from Manavita, Pope Paul VI. <laughs> and he's really struck by points 12 to 14. <laughs> and he thinks, you know, there's something in this, this, this love-making being coupled with life-making, you know, that the two have to go together. And he thinks, wow. I mean, it's a difficult one to try and explain to you, Hermione. It's a difficult one for me to try and even explain maybe to myself, but but maybe if I was to treat this principle that love making and life making have to go together, if I, if I was to treat that like the principle of non-contradiction, now you might be asking, what on earth is the principle of non-contradiction? Well, it's one of the most basic principles. Something cannot be and not be at the same time in the same sense. The same thing, either Daniel is Daniel in the same time in the same sense. Daniel is not Father Dom. I could say Daniel is Father Dom in a figurative sense, maybe, but there's a difference. And if you don't know the difference between one thing and another, between coffee and a cup of snot, I'm never going to ask you to make me a cup of coffee. <laughs> so th this, princi now this principle of non-contradiction can only really show itself when you take it to the reductio ad absurdum, when you show how it, things fall apart, when you don't hold to it. There are philosophers who say, no, 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 they're taking a Hegelian stance on it and say, no, there's a, it's a more dynamic than that. And, but really, things become absurd. Now, with the principle of life making and love making having to be together, when you uncouple them, as we do in our society, all over the shop, you might say, well, why not? Why can't I break the two apart? And again, I'd have to say, well, maybe it's a question of looking at the consequences and seeing how that plays out. And after 40 years, of this happening, and that, that, that encyclical of Humana Vita, what Pope Paul VI talks about as the consequences of uncoupling those, that, that principle, we see it in the relationship breakdowns all around us, and in the problems of the family all around us, and all the custody battles, and etc. etc. Now, these are big claims, big claims, but if you're prepared to really to, to reflect on that, you can see that things aren't going to, not that things have always been hunky dory, but it's prophetic what Paul VI says. And if you want to take it from another point of view, why don't you go to the female eunuch? Germaine Greer, after 40 years, 